All right. Uh, welcome uh, to the first panel of the day. Uh, it's the panel uh, Italian Excellence. Uh, and we have uh, uh, five uh, excellent panelists uh, with us today. Uh, five, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, the, um, my name is Nicola Persico. I'm a professor uh, at the Kellogg School of Management, uh, a, few, um, a few miles uh, north of here. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, I'm going to be the moderator uh, for this panel. We have a fantastic, um, a fantastic uh, participants here. Um, uh, Giacomo Cantù from Alex Partners, uh, Alberto Candelero from Dolce Gabbana, uh, Aldo Uva from Ferrero, uh, Joe Laiotin from uh, Whirlpool, uh, and Matteo Picariello from the Instituto, uh, Instituto Commercio Estero. So uh, let's uh, give them a warm welcome uh, to start with. All right. So uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to start. I have a sequence of questions, uh, and uh, um, we're going to try to make room for uh, audience questions towards the end. So uh, we have about an hour. I'm going to try to keep it a little shorter. Uh, this means uh, uh, I'm, part of my job is going to be to interrupt you uh, if you um, uh, uh, if you get closer, uh, exceed ten minutes. Uh, and uh, um, and so uh, l l let me let me start with the. Uh, with, with, with the process here. Uh, we're going to start with uh, questions about uh, personal development and don't, then we're going to expand uh, to questions about the Italian system uh, and succeeding as an Italian company. All right, so with that, uh, I'm going to move there, or maybe I'm not. Uh, and I'm going to start with my first question. Uh, and my first question is for Giacomo Cantù. Uh, and, uh, and the first question is about uh, uh, the leadership journey. Uh, and I want to ask Giacomo about uh, uh, his personal development as a manager uh, and how being Italian uh, impacted his uh, development uh, as a leader. Yeah. Thank you very much. Obviously, I'm a bit humbled by talking about myself. I think the guys here, we talk about excellence in manufacturing and research. Let's talk about leadership. So first of all, uh, I lead a team of 50 people here in the US. We do, uh, I'm leading the high tech practice and biotech practice. We help uh, the biggest corporation, what have you, Google and Apple and the biggest change, transform themselves. And um, obviously it, it might, Sounds weird that uh, actually two Italians lead a, a team of uh, 45 Americans doing so. So I, I think I want to tell you why I believe, uh, and that's obviously personal, so I don't want you to generalize, but why being Italian is, uh, is unique. What makes us unique? What gets in our way being Italian? And what we need to do, you have to do to harness and master excellence. So, First of all, what makes Italians unique? I think first of all is creativity and innovation uh, in everything we do. Even in my job, uh, the approach we come up with uh, are always, always uh, top notch in terms of innovation. I think a second one, we have very high standards. We bring on the table, we are never satisfied. We don't lie in the process. We, we look at the, at the results. And the third one, I think the, one of the most unique of all is the common sense. As you know, uh, the best way to learn is being told a tale. Our parents uh, tell us tales. Our community, because most of us have uh, families that have lived in a community or in a city for a long time. And then for years, we study Latin, Greek, what, what have you, tales. So we carry a lot of common sense. Our unconscious, I think, has a lot of experience. So all, this is all great. There are three things as well that are impediments to us. One is self-consciousness, which is the opposite of self-awareness of self-confidence. Uh, I think the Americans have a nice word, vain. We are vanitosi. This gets in our way, big time. The other one is the pessimism, the cynicism. 
not good. <laughs> and, um, and a bit of complacency. I think Luigi said, and my mother still today say, what are you doing, right? Where have you gone? Why have you wasted your ing nuclear engineering uh, degree? What are you doing? Uh, bravo, I mean, we, we are told that we are bravi, and we're bravi not because of we put effort in it, because we are, by definition, the best. This is, <laughs> this is a difficult uh, kind of legacy. Um, moving to what we need to harness, I, I wrote down a few things. One, professionalism. I think you all know what this is, but especially in this country, professionalism is, has to be practiced at the highest level. Uh, the second one is personal respect. If I look back in my career, I had to learn a lot in terms of personal respect, diversity, which you mentioned. Actually, yesterday, I took official sponsors, sponsorship of uh, LGBT, uh, lesbian, gay, bisex, and transgender in our partners. For me, it's been a journey. Personal respect, diversity is something that, again, as Italians, I believe we have a long way to go. Uh, the third one for me is you need to go all in, all in. Don't put yourself, take all the risks that you need to take. Unfortunately, all of, everything that I said before as a, as success factors are also a heavy legacy. It's like you go on a journey, you open a backpack and you start putting everything your mother gave you and then everything that your grandmother gave you. And then by the time you need to raise the backpack, it is a couple of tons and you don't move. Put all in, uh, no risk of failure. And then um, learn from your failures, treasure your weaknesses, work on your weaknesses. I have myself two personal coaches. Um, so be humble, uh, be hungry, learn, and uh, you're gonna be fantastic managers, fantastic professional, and as Luigi said, you're gonna go back and fix Italy. Yeah, that's my five-minute speech. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you also for being so timely. Uh, we may come back. Uh, to you. The, the, next, uh, uh, the next question uh, is for uh, Alberto Candelero. And, uh, um, and the question for him, again, excellent. Uh, is there an Italian style uh, and know-how uh, that there is reflected into the business culture of Italians abroad? Uh, some people talk about special flexibility, willingness to innovate. What are the distinguishing features based on your experience? Well, um, I think there is not a, um, a, we cannot def call an Italian style um, as we are not a monolithic uh, uh, society. I think like uh, uh, all societies, we have very different features, but there, there are a group of features that uh, uh, are common to us. I think um, uh, some of them come from historical point of view, and many have uh, already uh, talked about that. Um, a second uh, uh, feature that I, uh, I see in many of us is the way we lead, the, lay, the way we interact with people, uh, the way we talk to, uh, to our peers and our colleagues. Um, and then, uh, as you already mentioned, the creativity. I think uh, there is uh, there is a point there. So to go through these these uh, these um, these three uh, items, I would like to to remind you a little bit that uh, uh, I think one of the strengths of uh, Italy, uh, we've seen some bad aspects, but there are also good ones. Is the family? Uh, we come from a, a very we have strong links. Uh, not only in the nuclear family, the kids, the parents, but also two or three layers uh, uh, after it. And this brings us to, to, uh, to, uh, to be a society that, uh, that uh, um, 
has a, has a core values, uh, the emotional uh, part of, uh, of our uh, intelligence. Uh, to be a good manager, I think, is, is, uh, is not only to have this, the, the skills and the preparation, but you have also to be able to, to align and to drive your people towards what you want from them. So this part is it's, it's, it's key. Uh, and I think uh, the combination here for the people like you that are, I, I, I assume that all of the people that are in this class are prepared and getting prepared for something important. Uh, I tell you, don't, don't, uh, don't try to be a German. Don't try to be somebody that you're not. Uh, be yourself and try to, to uh, leverage the thing that when we deliver a bad message to our people, or when we have to tell, like the guy from Barilla, we have to close uh, our, our mill, we have to shut down a store, in my case, you do it uh, in a certain way that the people uh, actually react and, 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 and uh, jump on your bus, jump on your uh, boat and, and help you with what uh, you want to do. Uh, we, have, we are not uh, good at, uh, uh, I think, uh, imposing and uh, uh, conquer. Uh, there are some historical uh, interesting uh, sides of that. I was, was traveling with a, a former GSB uh, classmate to Ethiopia, and uh, we were going around. I don't know if you know, but Ethiopia has been conquered by Italy for one of a few uh, countries we did uh, during, during the Second World War. And for a uh, little before uh, that, uh, with Mussolini. And the people were uh, embracing us like, like we were Italian, fantastic. We were, we were telling stories that we were giving them shirts and giving them things. So I was, uh, was as high as possible. Uh, yesterday night, I was in the taxi with Aldo, and there was a guy, the driver was from Eritrea. And he, when he, heard, he heard us that we were Italian, he was like happy to hear us. So uh, uh, we, 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 it's, it's not ourselves to do certain things, and we have to recognize that. But uh, uh, the thing that, uh, that I've seen, I never I live in Latin America, no, I never heard somebody speaking about the Spaniards like these guys who are speaking about the Italians. It's true that passed many more years, but uh, uh, it means that we uh, create a very good uh, uh, relationship with people. We have empathy. Now, uh, the creativity, the world where I come from, uh, is definitely something we, we have because of our uh, artistical and, uh, and uh, uh, cultural heritage. Uh, I agree with Mr. Zingales, today is not enough. And I finish with, uh, with uh, a, a small little story because I, I want to give you a, a positive, uh, uh, positive uh, look at this. Um, when, I, when I was working in Spain at Xenia, I decided to uh, do my MBA, to look for an MBA. Um, and it was differently from, from Luigi. It was not uh, my family who was, uh, who was against it. I talked to my boss and I said, listen, I want to do this because uh, I did the uh, Liceo Classico. I, I, I studied law, so I think if I want to grow, I have to, to learn a little bit of math and, uh, and uh, other things, statistics. I remember I was scared about statistics. So uh, I, I applied to different MBAs, and, and by, he always worked with me that I do better what I'm more scared of. So I, I actually entered uh, in MIT, Columbia, and, uh, and the University of Chicago. I chose the University of Chicago because it was a traveling MBA. So I, I, I like to travel and uh, was an ex executive at that time was Barcelona, Singapore, and Chicago. Now it's London. So I went to my bosses. I tell them, listen, I entered. To, I was very, very happy. And the guy said, yes, yes, OK, go do it. But uh, uh, you, uh, we keep your, your job. But do you pay for it? And I said, no, if you don't bet on me, I don't bet on you. So I said bye bye to my company. I worked with, I tried with my family business. We, in textiles because we are from Biella. 
and sad, what happened is that uh, my, my, my family in that case was, was in favor and my company was not supporting. What happened is that after the MBA, that company realized that I changed it and was, was it maybe useful even in fashion for them. So they called me back and uh, they gave me uh, an interesting job for it. I was uh, 32 to develop for them an entire continent. So what I want to tell you is that I, I hope uh, that some of you end up in our sectors, in our sector, because every day more we need people prepared, people that are not only have the artistic and the, the uh, let's say the, 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 the sense of beauty, the, 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 uh, this, this side, but also a good preparation to, to help uh, uh, our excellence that are there to build and grow in a profitable way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alberto. Now turning to Aldo. Uh, my question for Aldo is this. Uh, Italian excellence is first and foremost about product excellence. For example, Nutella is delicious. It tastes great. Uh, and uh, but increasingly, millennial consumers are focused on attributes beyond the product, including corporate social responsibility, nutrition values, uh, etc. So is the next challenge to translate this product excellence into experience excellence, uh, such as Starbucks has achieved with coffee uh, and stores as a third place, uh, and with sustainably grown coffee? So my question is, uh, how do you, is this important to develop and how do you do it? Yeah, thank you and uh, good morning to everybody. It's um, no, it's a it's a, a great uh, it's a great uh, question because uh, uh, the point is that we need to start uh, to understand how really to move from excellence uh, in product uh, to excellence in experience. This is what uh, all is happening, and uh, this is one probably of, of one of the biggest diseases of, of our nation. We are uh, a lot in love. Uh, with the product uh, uh, by itself. And we don't uh, really uh, understand which could be the impact of uh, the product in the ecosystem. I mean, there are a lot of examples how things are changing uh, today. I mean, Italy is one of the most uh, uh, clear example, how to put Italian excellence uh, uh, under the same roof, but uh, with, uh, uh, with a concept of, of, of excellence uh, uh, without uh, starting uh, from the product, but going from the product through the experience and creating the right, uh, the right experience. So uh, often, uh, and I'm, I've, uh, in my career, I've been working in uh, seven different companies, uh, uh, Italian companies, European companies, American companies, uh, in different places. And uh, I can say that uh, what there is unique of, uh, of Italy is this uh, huge love for the details of a perfect product. It is good. Now we need to start to migrate from this to the next step. This is how to create a fantastic and perfect uh, uh, experience around the product. Now, Italy is easy. It's simple. You put uh, a lot of great brands uh, under the same roof in a store. People, they go there and they can experience Starbucks is easy, because Starbucks, uh, they have created a concept uh, around the store. People, they go there, they were asking me, will be Starbucks successful, yesterday, they were asking me, will be Starbucks successful in Italy? Uh, and my answer is probably yes, but not because of the product, but because of the experience. If you look at uh, the Italian, what we call bar, cafes, they were a concept for the silent generation and for the baby boomers. Go there, get a coffee, get a croissant, and then get out. Millennials, uh, or Generation X and Y, they are starting to work with a completely different concept. They want places that we can stay longer to chat, to work, to study, whatever. So the reason why Starbucks could be successful in Italy, it is because experience is becoming more and more important uh, of, of, of the product. Now, Italy is simple, Starbucks is simple. The question is how you can uh, translate an experience when you have a brand, or how you can start to think at an experience when you have a brand. And, and you know, one, uh, one of the reasons why 15 months ago I have accepted uh, uh, to move from, uh, uh, from a Swiss company to Ferrero is because I've always been intrigued on why Ferrero has brands that are always the same since 50, 30, 40 years. 
why they have never really changed is because Ferrero and, and the group has always thought of the product and of the brand as an experience more than as a product itself. Let's take uh, Kinder Surprise, the Kinder Egg. The Kinder Egg is not about the toy. The Kinder Egg is not about the chocolate. It's about the bonding between uh, a mother or a father and a child. It's the experience. You don't buy a Kinder Egg because only because you want to give the best uh, product uh, or the best chocolate uh, to your son or to your daughter, but also because we want to gratify the person. It's an experience. It's an experience that magically blows from a small egg. Take Nutella. Is Nutella what? Is Nutella a product or is Nutella an experience? Nutella is an experience because apart from I mean, your wife, probably the majority of the people are uh, enjoying Nutella with something else. I mean, I don't know if you have seen the news today of, Star of uh, McDonald's uh, putting on the menu uh, a Nutella sandwich uh, for, uh, for breakfast. And they are announcing it with pride. I mean, uh, this means that Nutella is not a brand. It's more than a brand. It's more than a product. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge experience. So it's embedded in our culture, the experience. So when, when people tell me, yes, but Italians, really, they cannot really win because you know, they don't really understand experience because they are only focused on the product, I'm saying it's wrong. It is wrong because it's in our DNA experience, it's worth much more than the product. However, we are mentally constrained sometimes to think that the only thing that counts is, uh, is, is the product itself. You know how many entrepreneurs that still uh, I, I meet when I go back uh, 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 to Italy? They are uh, still uh, uh, not, uh, have not been able to do this, uh, let's say, this, this, uh, this migration from product to experience. And uh, if Italy wants really to restart and to restart uh, bigger and bigger, really the translation of what excellence in product is into the translation of what excellence in uh, experience is, this is something that should, should be done. And for you guys, that you are starting to approach a new life, Let's try to understand that uh, that is a combination of, of different things that uh, make a success. It's always the balance of different factors that really create a success. It's never one single variable that makes a success. Of course, you need to always have a leading indicator, a leading factor to lead to success. But there's always the combination of several factors that lead to success. So if we start to go and to leverage our creativity, our innovation, our leadership, our willingness of uh, our flexibility, and we combine all this with the idea that experience is what matters, I believe we could continue to be a strong com a stronger nation, and we can build more and more Ferreros around the world. Because if Ferrero is there since 70 years, uh, and no one is, has been able to copy a Rocher that you have on the table, or a, or, a, or a Nutella that you were enjoying, it's exactly because it's not about the product. It's also about the product. It's more about uh, uh, the experience. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, now moving, moving to Joe. <clears throat> uh, Joe's, uh, Joe's company uh, has invested in Italy. And, uh, uh, and so the question is, how does a large multinational company see Italy as a place for doing business? Uh, does it make sense to invest in Italy? This is a big question, obviously, uh, and uh, we don't expect a, you know, a full spectrum answer. But from, from your perspective, what is the, uh, uh, the answer? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Nicola. Yeah, I mean, Whirlpool's been um, in Italy for a few decades. Um, really, we had the opportunity in the last, let's say, two years to find a uh, strategically synergistic opportunity with the Indusit company. Uh, and the two companies ended up merging uh, for lots of very, I think, productive reasons for the company in that um, Indesit had done things very well. They were basically chief competitors both in Italy as well as in other markets. Um, and from a product portfolio, from a brand portfolio, from a technology portfolio, they had done certain things well but differently. So they were good complements. And so we've recently, you know, gone through the acquisition, uh, gone through the integration, and, you know, we're almost twice the size we once were. Um, 
with this uh, pickup of, of business. And, you know, that was a big decision because there are lots of reasons to say maybe Italy isn't the right place to be. And if we were going to do all this, should we change the footprint? Should we change our headquarter location? Should we move our, our research and technology centers? And by and large, um, instead, the answer really was, no, nope, those are all the right places to be. The fact that the product excellence, a little bit to the point made earlier, the technology um, and really uh, research and capability excellence, both in our uh, Castaneda facilities and Fabriano faci uh, facilities for Indesit, it made it very obvious to stay. And so we've actually, um, you know, introduced more investment. We'll put $500 million in um, in the next couple years in just kind of infrastructure, capital, manufacturing, and technology. 90% um, of all r and &E dollars for Whirlpool in, in all of Europe will be in Italy um, over the next couple of years. And really the hubs of our manufacturing footprint in our cooking um, and really refrigeration areas are going to be in between the, the Castaneda facilities and the Fabriano facilities and a little bit in Siena. Uh, so really it was a very attractive place to be. I think the, the reason for that um, had to go back to the successes both companies had had, but also the complementarity of the products and technologies. Um, it really drove kind of a, a good big decision. And so, as many of you know, um, it's good to have scale in Europe in total, but it's much more important to have country-specific scale. Um, that's where you get brand leverage, consumer leverage, uh, supply chain leverage. Uh, and, and this, for Italy, made us the number one player in that market. And that enabled us to do lots of things, I think, a little bit better than we had in the past. Um, also, the, uh, the work between the two companies you know, around brands, there are different brands with different consumer targets, with different price indices and different constructs in terms of a plan to sell and a model lineup. So it really enabled us to target pretty much all consumers um, in a much more direct way. As instead of using some brands having to work harder to target consumers that maybe weren't as intuitive. Uh, so if you, you put all that back together, I mean, we're in the process really of um, kind of refortifying those investments and launching lots of product with the best of best, either from Indesit or from Whirlpool and bringing that to market as fast as we can. Um, we're actually in the, in the process of moving our headquarters from Camario and Varese to Milan um, as another step to say, you know, we're probably gonna be there long-term. Um, it's a little bit easier for us to attract talent, uh, both from the Milan market, but also, um, you know, for all of Europe and globally uh, when we're centered and near Milan as opposed to in, in Varese. And so those are kind of votes of confidence to say, hey, we expect to be there for the long term. We believe it'll be productive, uh, both in the Italian market as well as what it will export to the rest of Europe. And our headquarters being there and, and near Milan provides certain benefits in terms of attraction of people. Uh, so, you know, all in all, those have been very positive things. I can tell you, we considered lots of scenarios uh, prior to the acquisition. And this is not an acquisition that I think came um, very abruptly. These were probably things that were discussed or contemplated over a decade, probably. And so there were other alternatives, you know, pick up and move and, and maybe invest in other places or, or separate the global footprint, manufacturing footprint and the research footprint. Um, and so, you know, it was, uh, I think, a, a very confidence boost to the team to say, hey, yes, the teams have been doing lots of things well, uh, differently, but well, and then together that could be much more powerful. Uh, so all that's, I think, you know, pretty exciting and kind of a big bet for a big U.S based company to do in Italy. Um, a little bit maybe to uh, the points Aldo just made, you know, product was the reason why Indesit and Whirlpool had done a good job and grown multi-billion dollar businesses for both companies. But the next frontier isn't solely or one-dimensionally product. The next frontier for appliances is, is, is pretty fantastic in terms of IoT, Internet of Things, and connected. And so really that goes back to the comments made about experience. Um, it won't be about what the machine does in isolation on one dimension in terms of performance. Um, it'll be much more about the connectedness of how your range um, either helps you get recipes from different web providers or, or different apps, how to dream and consider, how to um, contemplate what's already in your fridge in terms of inventory management, how to communicate um, through the process. That's really the next frontier um, for, for Whirlpool um, in total, but specifically in our technology centers in Italy. And so that goes full circle to understanding what those use cases are from consumers. And really, there's no better place to understand at least the kitchen uh, and how it works and what's important and where passion points and how to uh, communicate to really make it an effective and compelling um, food journey experience 
And when you're rushed, because it's an evening and you've picked up your children or whatever it might be, and you only have a half hour to cook, that's one experience. Another experience is on the weekend, maybe you're having guests, family. You know, the, the dreaming and the um, amount of elaborate steps required uh, for that is, is, is much different. And we think Whirlpool is kind of at the center of that. And technology really will, will transform that from a one-dimensional product to really an experience in the kitchen, a food journey, as we, as we call it, with technology playing a very big role, but behind the scenes, enabling things as opposed to up front. So that's a little bit about kind of why uh, both, you know, Indusit was important to Whirlpool, why Italy was a very attractive place, and why the future is set up very well uh, for, for Whirlpool to grow in Italy and, and the core assets of product excellence, engineering, technology, and a strong um, kind of focus and expertise in, in culinary really kind of is, is the right recipe for Whirlpool in Italy. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, uh, Matteo Picariello, uh, the Trade Commissioner. Uh, what does the uh, institute, your uh, institute, do? How does the uh, uh, help Italian companies grow abroad? Uh, and what are the institute's unique challenges? Thank you, Nicola. Buongiorno a tutti. So first of all, let me send you the apology and greeting from my president, Michele Scannavini, who couldn't be present. So I have a task to answer the question on his behalf. And so ICE is a public organization. So we are funded and controlled by the Ministry of Economic Development. And we have a very similar system to the diplomatic body. So we have offices around the world. We have five offices here in the States. So Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, Miami, and recently we opened Houston. And every country has a very similar system. So we have different like format but basically each country has a trade promotion organization with a focus to help their companies to go abroad, mainly to export, but also to establish a presence, to internationalize and to invest in the countries. So when I was invited, uh, my organization was invited to this conference, let me point out that I really like the title of the conference. So I don't know if you are aware, but the extraordinary uh, commonplace is the title of a small promo video that the ministry and my organization did for the Aspen meeting in 2015. And there is a link also to Chicago because this video was made by the Italian branch of Leo Burnett, so the media company was an American company based here in Chicago. This video is like a five minutes video. If you haven't seen it, I, invite, uh, I will send you a link and I invite you to see it because it's like a very short presentation of excellencies of Italy. And it was very well received Strangely enough, in Italy, where everything is so difficult to get, you know, a positive feedback, but mainly abroad as well. And if you think about this, how a very simple thing like a promo video can be considered something innovative, it tells you a lot of the difficulties and the challenges that Italy has when they face the foreign markets. And there are a few reasons that I will try to be very brief in explaining this. And first of all, let me say that there is a problem with investment. So Italy, because of its industrial structure, because of the size of the company, cannot spend as much as other countries do. And this is not public, only public spending, but if you consider that in a market like US, usually a big company, a multinational company, has a budget of around 50 million US dollar per year. So which is a huge amount that many small, medium-sized companies cannot afford. So when you, when you analyze the brand ranking, international ranking, you, you will see only few Italian brands. So you are lucky enough to have some of the best representative here at, at this uh, panel, at, at this meeting. But for most of the other companies, this is a real struggle. So how to... The, recently, the government tried to change this, you know, what, what was done in the past with a very simple solution. So in the past, the investment was spread among so many different, like, countries, sectors, and everybody was pulling from for, uh, his own piece of the pie. So in 2015, U.S. was considered as a focus target for Italy. 
and we receive uh, a budget of around 50 million uh, uh, euros, focusing specifically for the food sector, with aim of counter like, or let me say, educate the consumers towards the real authentic products versus the, what we call Italian sounding. So, you know, all the Italian name items made by American, Canadian, or Australian companies. And the results were very positive. We had also a parallel program towards the big retailers. Now we are, we are partnering with all the bigger retailers in the States. But I think it was a change. So for the first time, we saw that the government effort was focusing, so there, were, there was a capacity to make a choice, which is a very neat, clear, and strong choice. The second point I would like to mention is the industrial policy. So the export promotion, the export policies in the past lacked for a lack of industrial policy in Italy. So recently, if you can recall, there was a during when Bersani was minister, Industry 2015, which was one of the most recent big efforts in order to facilitate our innovation of the industry of the manufacturing sector. Last month, uh, the new minister, Calenda, presented in Italy what we call Manufacturing 4.0. And again, I don't know if you have heard about it. If not, again, I invite you to, to read and understand what's going on in Italy and how Italy is trying to change. And why is it important? Is it important for, first of all, Europe is doing the same since a while. So there is a huge European program, which is called Horizon 2020. And in the past, there was the belief that there was no possibility for the local, for the nation, for the countries to do and to fund similar programs. So now, this problem was solved, so the government decided to invest. And for the first time again, an indus the investment is mainly to support the Italian industry in Italy, you know, so to create demand, to create renovation. There was like refunding for purchase of new machinery for changing. But this program will again be linked to a foreign market. So we will, we are defining and we will present soon in Italy a program where manufacturing for can zero can have a window also in foreign markets. And the companies that will be part of this program in Italy will have a chance to be abroad with us or by themselves. So this is, again, a second point which I think is very important and somehow is disruptive to what was perceived in the past as one of the Italian uh, problems. The third one is most difficult because the, the third one is uh, the size of Italian companies. Okay. And the, this is like my daily struggle when we help mainly SMEs, so very small companies, to find a partner, to find a distributor, to find an agent. And we see, when we see the numbers, so in, in Italy we have like two statistics says that we have two million companies, and this includes everything. 98% they are small, companies. And when we say small, we, we don't think with a uh, uh, U.S. value. So we think small Italy, so because there is a difference. And uh, when we see how many of these companies are able to export, so they sell their items, their products in the foreign markets, we see that this number shrink to 200,000. So 2 million, 200,000. And you're going to think when we do our yearly planning and programs, which is kind of small number, but is still a good base. And every year we try to figure out how this number can increase. But if you dig into the numbers a bit more specifically, you find out that the vast majority of these companies, they export to one single country, mainly Germany, and they export no consistency. So they don't, a year they do, the year after they don't. And most importantly, the value of their export is very low. So the average export capacity of this company per year is 20,000 euro. So it's minimal. And again, why is that? Okay, first reason is because that's Italy. So Italy is the country of a small, medium-sized company. For many, many years, we believe that small is beautiful until we realize that Worldwide, 
Maybe it's not always like this. And the second point is because, again, the export policies were considered like a survival policy. So if you are a small company, especially in the local territorial uh, su support, if you are a small company and you struggle because your internal market, your domestic market is shrinking, what you do? You receive some help, some support to go out to sell, and then as soon as the condition get better, you don't need to do anymore. So there was no a long-term vision. Now, I may say that you know the crisis had to change things a lot. The government has completely re reviewed this approach. So now the export policy is more and more integrated in the industrial policy, and this is very important. And uh, lastly, I, as was said before, you are the future of our country, so we are very proud of what you do. We are very proud that you, know, you challenge yourself going abroad. It's not easy, even if America is a country that welcomes everybody, but it's not easy to come here to study hard. But these companies need you back in Italy. So it's not just you know, going for the, the solution, but there is a, a, a real need. And this need is there. It's, need to be, it's there to build field because if you consider that out of these 200,000 companies, I don't know, there is a beautiful report which is done every year by Mediobanca about what they call the fourth capitalism. And the number, or what we call here, multinational taskability. So we have some examples here. So companies that don't have yet a global scale as Coca Cola or VBS companies, but are bigger than the average medium com size company in Italy. And the number of these companies is 4,000. So this is the study that Medibanca does. So we have only 4,000 companies with this capacity. And these companies account for 80%, more or less, it varies per year, of it overall Italian exports. So if you consider we have 2 million companies and 4,000 of these account for 80%. And many of these companies, we need to increase this number. So we need to add the small ones, but we also need to add these companies to establish branch, to enlarge, to conquer the markets, and they need your help. So that's my wish for all of you and for our country. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, one of the stereotypes of Italian is that we're always late, but uh, not in this case. Our panelists uh, have given us a good 15 minutes for questions. Uh, so at this point, I'd like you to start thinking about any questions that you'd like to ask our panelists. Uh, and uh, if there are no questions, or if I don't see any hands uh, shooting up, oh, excellent, one question. Okay, so a um, question for Mr. Pitabiallo. I found the data you shared about the small and medium enterprises very enlightening, especially the fact that um, only 200,000 exports and the average export amount is 20,000 euros. Um, I wanted to ask you, what, is the, what are the actions that the government is taking, um, is uh, setting up in order to uh, change this, in order to allow these companies to grow in scale and have a much more organic and uh, sustainable approach to exports and, and, and essentially to, to get out of this trap that they seem to be... To be, to, to, to be um, placed in. Okay, so the question is for me, but I, I welcome everybody to, you know, to answer from their experience. So I would say that there are mainly two uh, policies. So one is we have a budget, and this budget is helping this company to lower their cost when they go abroad. So from the very simple participating to a trade show, so instead they can be facilitating cost-wise and organization-wise. The second and probably most important aspect is uh, education. So we have a strong uh, training program for export managers, for young graduates, for managers from the companies. We work together with a major university in Italy. So the idea is that for these companies, not only they need to get the right contacts to lower the cost, but they need to change their vision, to change their attitude, and to get the right people to do it. Thank you. Uh, any other questions so far? Please. 
So in the context of the words of Professor Singales, who actually pointed out a lack of good management in Italy, and maybe also recalling the famous Fuga di Cervelli, and given that many of you on the panel actually are still in the States, I'm curious to know what is preventing you from coming back to the country and what needs to happen for Italians to move back there as well, from your perspective. Yeah, this is a question for anyone, so Aldo, if you want to... Yeah. I mean, we need, we need really to understand uh, if we are talking about uh, uh, working in Italy or working uh, for an Italian company and promoting it. There are, there are, there are, two, different, uh, there are two different angles. To me, the point is that in the moment in which uh, Italy will solve uh, the issue of uh, leadership and will solve the issue of management, uh, then uh, uh, working in Italy will be uh, easier, will be, will be, will be simpler. Um, you know, Joe was talking about uh, a whirlpool that has both indices. I've been, I don't know how many of you know, but I've been working with Vittorio Merloni with Indesit for almost 14 years. Uh, and Vittorio was, was a genius, was a, was a guy that was inventing things. And now, Joe, you're telling that you're starting to work on interaction between domestic appliances and the human. In 1992, Vittorio Merloni started uh, a program with Harvard to understand how to create intelligent domestic appliances. This tells you that the vision is what is driving. Well, I will always say, so if you take at uh, Vittorio Merloni, he was, he was building an empire in a place where there are only two roads, that they, one goes in and one goes out, Fabriano. If uh, you look at, uh, P, uh, at uh, Michele Ferrero, Michele Ferrero has built a, a, an empire in Alba. That is a place that uh, is not very close to an airport. Now you're moving uh, your headquarter to Milan because it's easier for you to fly. So I'm happy for this, but uh, we have examples in Italy that are really, make, uh, are really helping to understand that the vision is what is driving everything. The vision of entrepreneur, the commitment uh, of the territory, the support of the politics. Why the Italian system, in my opinion, went down? Because the Italian system was extremely strong when there was the combination and the same vision between the politics, the political system, the entrepreneurs, and the territory. Then at a certain point in Italy, the territory and the workers, they become cost. They become cost. And then in the moment in which uh, one of the three components that is a success becomes a liability, suddenly the old system blows up. So the point is we will continue to strive to bring up uh, Italian business more and more. We'll continue to make sure that in Italy you can have the right government. Gov no one talks about governance of the Italian companies. Governance is extremely important, guys. Because you go back to Italy and you go back to work for an Italian company, governance is very clear. If you have the opportunity and the possibility to do something, if the meritocracy is there, if you know that uh, you could uh, do the, make the difference because of what you can deliver, not of because uh, what you could, uh, you could, uh, or where you come from. So, you know, a lot should change. A lot should, should continue. Why, why there are a lot of companies that are, uh, let's say, only a lot, two million companies, and they are not going to the next level? Because a lot of Italian entrepreneurs, they don't really understand that put their companies in the hands of a young graduate, a young MBA, someone that has a, a completely different uh, view of the world. It's worth much more than uh, for a long-term strategy than what they can get uh, tomorrow by using only people that they have an understanding of the, the local territories. It's almost 35 years that I'm outside of Italy. Almost 35 years that uh, I'm not working in the home country and now I'm back. And I'm telling you that the only thing that I've seen have not really happened is a, a huge transformation in the top leadership of our country, of our companies in our countries. And you know, Ferrero is an example, but you know, you would like to work two millions of Ferrero. And I don't want to talk about uh, other companies. So I stop here, but Joe, one, one, one big, eh? you both, Indesit, uh, Indesit is part of your business today, it's part of you. Make sure that Indesit stays Indesit. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Anybody else wants to take up this question? Yeah, I have one question for uh, Mr. Uh, uh, please, no. we're still no, I, uh, on the previous uh, question. Yeah, so please, I want Jack. to stress uh, meritocracy. I, I cannot do my job in Italy because uh, uh, we are driving fast change, very fast change. 
and uh, you know we need active investors we need investors that um, true capitalism where time is of essence and uh, it's all about money and change silicon valley is changing every morning you wake up and it's different but this is obviously something that is too profound. I mean, but the meritocracy, the envy for success, is a big problem. This company uh, rewards and admires successful people, even if they are 22 or 25 years old. We still have a reflex that if you are successful, multimillionaire, oh, something is wrong with you, right? Someone must have helped you. Uh, I love this country because this really um, uh, respects professionalism and respects success, right? As a poor Italian with my accent, my beard, whatever I have, I can sit with the CEO of an 85 billion company, 85 billion, and he's listening. Is listening, and he respects the experience. So, probably this is too personal. <laughs> I don't know how to solve it. <laughs> it's too cultural. So I cannot go back. In essence. Thank you, Giacomo. Uh, I hope the beard is not the obstacle, but no, no. <laughs> actually, my team is going a bit. <laughs> Anybody wants to take? Uh, anybody else wants to take up this question of uh, working in, uh, in Italy, working for an Italian company abroad? Possible, not possible. No? Well, I have an, an example of my tomorrow. We'll speak here, Pietro Sella, who is uh, the CEO of, uh, of uh, a bank from my city, which is called Biella. It's a small city of 60,000 60, people, all the all the region. Until. Ten years ago, uh, ago, that city was uh, uh, very well known worldwide for fabrics of high-end fabrics. Uh, it's where Cerruti, 1881, was born, where Fila was, was born, where Menegildo Zegna was born, and then all the fabric producers. Well, what happened in, the, in that city in the last ten years is that uh, uh, our fabric uh, system and industry uh, collapsed because we are not able to uh, exactly to make a, 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 to jump from a, a, an excellent product to to uh, see and, and understand that something was coming uh, from abroad, and so we needed to 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 get together to to uh, to create a system locally, and not many little families trying to do their business. Uh, when I met. Uh, um, Mr. Picariello, I met him in, in North and South Korea many years ago. We were discussing yesterday because uh, we uh, we were trying with this uh, industrial uh, non industriale biellese industrial chamber of a city to go and 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 uh, abroad and try to sell. We also, but always alone, always uh, individually. So that proved to be wrong, in my opinion. So to 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 go back uh, to Italy, you also have to to uh, to choose uh, to choose the right uh, the right company that uh, have uh, the right strategy for for the future. In my in my opinion. Thank you, thank you. So it's the the general lesson here: it's possible, it's desirable, uh, but you have to know where you're going back. That that's critical. Uh, any other questions uh, back there? Please. One question maybe for uh, Mr. Candelero. In uh, France, uh, talking about also the size of companies in Italy, in France uh, we've observed uh, the creation of uh, multi-brand uh, luxury giants uh, and we have not seen this happening in Italy. Why is that the case? Again, I think it's because of our uh, uh, individualism that I have to, uh, have to, to add that uh, the creation of the Congo is actually one buying another one. So there's not, there's not been uh, a, a consensual uh, merging of company. In other words, there are two big players, which is Caring, now called Caring, uh, and um, LVMH, which are been shopping around uh, in all the luxury 
uh, environment. And actually, they started to buy also Italian companies. Uh, but they have been smart because in the way they are doing, actually did what uh, Aldo was suggesting to Whirlpool to do. They tried uh, very hard to respect our our brands. When you go to Gucci, you 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 see uh, you think still of Italy. I, I'm still surprised how many people don't know that Gucci is not Italian anymore. Uh, like, like, likewise, Fendi, likewise, many others. Now, Italian companies, uh, there are some, what they did, instead of joining together, which actually in our, for, for, for the differences, for the DNA uh, of the companies, very difficult. What we did, someday we, go, we went IPO. That's what Ferragamo did. Uh, and, and so they, they raised money to, to grow. That's what Prada did. But uh, there are still few big brands. If we put, to, to, um, I was calculating that with some friends. If we put it together, we we are we are like like the LVMH or like caring, adding the, the each. Imagine the power they have to negotiate with the providers compared with us when we go and uh, uh, to to negotiate whatever thing we need to to work. So um, I think. Uh, um, the problem is, uh, is that yes, we are we are strong, but we are still divided. We are still very very separate. Thank you. So so the answer goes back to this question that's being uh, talked about: large and small companies, and, and particularly maybe maybe a little too small uh, in Italy. Uh, we have a couple more minutes. Are there any other questions? If not, then I'm going to exercise my prerogative as a. Uh, <laughs> Uh, as a discussant here, as a, a moderator, uh, and ask a question to uh, Mr. Picariello. And this is the question about uh, the TTIP. And, uh, uh, and, and this, this is a, a trade treaty that's being negotiated uh, these days, that was being negotiated, now we don't know, with the new uh, president here in the United States, uh, with, uh, between the EU uh, and the United States, uh, that was going to cover many, many aspects uh, of regulation, and, and particularly uh, the issue of uh, IP, Italian sounding, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, would, that, would that be a desirable, uh, a desirable treaty, uh, in your opinion, for Italy? Okay. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I believe the treaty will be on standby for a while after the election. But let's say that I even in the recent times, it, it was not so very well welcome, despite the benefits that Personally, I believe, but many studies prove also where we're going to be. And from my personal point of view, when you see that a treaty is uh, attacked from both sides, and both sides are saying that there is no benefit for them, there should be something wrong. Because either way has to gain something out of it. There is no possible, there is a loss from both sides. So in US, the movement against it agreement and in Europe was saying the same things from different point of view. So there was something wrong in communication. Unfortunately, even if the agreement was going to be in place, it's not going to incorporate, if not for a very small and limited part, the denomination. So it's not like the agreement was recently uh, the CETA, uh, written with uh, Canada, where finally we got protection, we will have protection for our denomination of origins. So the agreement that was under discussion with US was not yet incorporating this. Okay, so we'll still have American Parmigiano. Yes. Then. All right. <laughs> well, with that, uh, let me thank uh, the speakers here. Please help me thank them. And we'll move on to the next part of the conference. Thank you.